Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that was great when Alison introduced me. She got to my name, somebody got up and walked out just as she said my name. That was a good start. So Friday afternoon at Game Connection, you've probably all been here since Wednesday morning. It's been a long time. So I'll try and keep this reasonably snappy. The, uh, the PC market, in my opinion, is probably the most dynamic and interesting market right now for lots of reasons, um, some of which I hopefully I'll cover. Um, and just to be clear, when I talk about the PC market, I really mean Windows, Linux, and Mac. I don't just mean the Windows PC market. I think one of the interesting features of this market already is that you've got these very different players um, and really, we're talking about the desktop, the study, the laptop device as a platform and all that goes with it. The other thing that's complex here is because of the electronic setup, I've got to press two buttons when I change slides. So if that doesn't change and I start talking about something different, shout at me because I haven't looked at it. Right, so that's, that's me. That's me, right, good. Okay, that works. So just as a bit of background on me, uh, I'm a game developer by background. So I've been making games since the end of the 1980s, which is a long, long time ago. Um, I was the CEO and one of the founders at a company called Kuja Entertainment, which is one of the UK's largest developers. Um, we built that business up to about 300 people, six studios around the world. And so my background, as I say, very much is in game development. These days I tend to get more involved in events as an investor or as a consultant which is how I spend a lot of my time these days, actually working with small companies on their strategy or doing early stage investment. So I'm involved in quite a few games companies these days. Don't work for Kuju anymore. Okay, so the first thing to state is clearly the recent history of the whole games industry is one of complete revolution. And that revolution has been driven by the move from retail over to digital distribution. And in many ways, it, the interesting thing for me about this with the PC is this is a platform that died on retail. I mean, it was just absolutely dying on retail globally. And the, the pickup to digital for the, for the PC market was a sort of savior. It was, it was something that came along almost in an unexpected way. It was undoubtedly an unplanned, unstructured, unmanaged move. Nobody was trying to make this happen in a coherent way. There was no equivalent of the App Store. There was no equivalent of the careful move to Xbox services and PlayStation Network and things like that. Nobody was planning this. We just had this kind of retail death of the PC market going on around us. Digital arrived mostly in the guise of Steam, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is going to be about Steam. But the, the arrival of digital clearly has totally transformed the industry in lots and lots of ways. And I think before we go on, it's worth just covering a couple of points that are um, features of retail, old school retail, that have kind of gone away and things that have kind of come in to replace them. I know a lot of this is very obvious, but I think it's very important sometimes to just pull out some of these fundamental features. So we lost all the shipping costs. We lost all of the inventory costs, massive, massive inventory costs, which were just are a big problem for retail, whether you're talking about console or PC. And those two changes are huge. The fact that you have apparently infinite, uh, infinite inventory and apparently zero shipping costs. But if we actually look at the, the detail there, if you move away from free-to-play models, and most PC games online are still sold at some kind of premium price point, then actually there are some real issues with billing and transaction costs, which mean it isn't free, and which actually define somewhat of a lower barrier on some of the PC long-tail pricing models that we see at the moment. And I think this whole question of whether really it is infinite inventory, whether you can just put as many games as you like up in as many places and never cannibalize your own sales is a really, really interesting question. And what PC is learning to do, because it is such an open and flexible market, is that, that is the area, I think, and I'll keep coming back to this, where people are in a position to learn, play, try new things with life cycle management in terms of pricing, inventory, sales, bundling, marketing channels. There's all sorts of things you can do on PC because it is essentially an open, unregulated market. Where elsewhere, some of these things can be played with, some of them can be tried, but always within the framework of somebody else's platform, whether it's the App Store or somebody like Sony or Microsoft. So the PC market has been totally radically revolutionized by digital, like every other games market. 
but it's had to learn some new things and it's still learning a lot of new things as it goes along. I think the other thing to say about this effectively infinite inventory model is I think if you're a small developer, it is true. You can put games wherever, you can sell them, and you're almost certainly going to be selling them to a new customer for you. You're never really competing with yourself at all, so you're always trying, you're never cannibalizing sales by moving prices down. You're always sitting there in a position to exploit new, new markets and new opportunities. If you're a bigger developer, or you're working with a successful long-term franchise, then that isn't true. You've then instantly got to start thinking about lifecycle management on your products and pricing. And obviously, if you're a very big developer or a very big publisher, you have to start recognizing that there's only going to be one big football game. There's only going to be a very small number of big shooters that people are playing. And eventually, you will hit the issue, if you're really lucky, of just competing with other people for a limited amount of game playing time. But for most of us, as small developers, you've effectively got infinite inventory and an infinite audience. And that's a very interesting set of parameters to throw into conventional economics around pricing and marketing. Now, so as I say, the, the good thing about the PC, and I think this is where it wins out repeatedly in all the conversations we're going to have, is it is unstructured and it's uncontrolled. So at the moment, you can try just about anything. There's some mechanism, some distribution model, some price point, some billing mechanism that will let you support that. And I think one of the things I'm going to come back to again and again is whilst that unstructured, unmanaged way of doing things undoubtedly has drawbacks, and it's undoubtedly difficult to operate a big business in that, that way. Actually, as a small business, as somebody in a creative industry where you're trying to do innovative and interesting things, then actually the ability to play and try new things is a real strength of a platform. And people often miss that about the PC. They miss the fact that the fact that you can be a bit crazy is a good thing often. So I think the key thing, though, at the moment is whether we can drive a big free-to-play audience on PC. We're seeing that as an enormously successful pricing model on mobile. It's really driving almost all the growth in mobile right now. And I think there are all sorts of structural questions about whether the PC is going to be able to make that same transition and make that same move. I think if the audience is there, and if the audience can be found, if the audience can be made to work on this platform, then there will be a huge drive to free-to-play. So I think that side of it, because we've seen how that works on free-to-play, because we've seen how those models can be made to work in terms of the nature of the games, the nature of the player we need to address, in this case, this should be about evolution. If the PC can continue to grow, which it does do every year in terms of install base, despite the success of other platforms, if we can still reach, if we can continue to reach new audiences on a steady basis, then the models we can support, the pricing models, the gameplay models, the genres that we can support, will continue to grow around it. And I personally see this as something which will just be a period of evolution for some time to come as the PC continues to grow out from its existing relatively hardcore and indie audience into a wider and wider audience based on the lessons learned from other platforms. I want to come on to bundling briefly. This is one of the areas where the PC has done really, really well. Okay, as a platform, because, again, it's unmanaged, uncontrolled, there are all kinds of uh, companies putting together custom bundles of PC games, whether this is Humble, Bundle Stars, a company I work with, which is Indie Royale. You know, there are various people who play with it. Often they're just bundling up Steam keys or keys for other platforms. But the fact is that some of them work across platforms. Some of them work with DRM. Some of them work with downloads instead of keys. Again, totally unstructured in the sense of no being able to plan this model, but it has worked incredibly well. And what we've seen with the bundling model is the ability to disguise the price point that you're selling the game at, the ability to give consumers a new discovery channel because they might buy two or three, they might want two or three of the games in, say, a five or six game bundle, but they get all six, so they'll suddenly discover some games they didn't previously have. The other thing we get is the arrival of the sort of collection mentality. The audience that we have on PC is generally slightly more knowledgeable, slightly more into their games, perhaps, than mobile. There's a broad brush uh, generalization. And what we've seen an awful lot of is people running up libraries of hundreds of games that they don't play on Steam and on other platforms. 
And actually being able to drive that collection mentality is a really interesting uh, thing that I don't think many developers are seeking to do. They're not trying to take advantage of it. Perhaps they can't because they're not producing enough games. But I think there is a really interesting thing going on there where people just want to own, even though they're digital assets, there's nothing physical, they just want to own a huge collection of games. And bundling has played right into that strength. I think the other thing we're seeing is that with bundles, you're also not only playing to the collection mentality, you're playing to the kind of modern bulk consumption, the sit down and watch an entire box set of a TV series approach to consuming content. I think people like the idea that they're going to sit down for increasingly long sessions to consume a particular type of content. They don't necessarily expect that all to be the same game. So I think that mobile habit of playing for smaller periods of time, playing more games and chopping and changing between them is coming across to the PC audience. But what they're doing is they're doing that by buying multiple games from multiple sources and playing in sessions where they might play several games at once. So I think bundling has really hit a nerve. It's really hit a moment where it's, got, it's found an audience that's worked very, very well. And certainly if you look at Humble Bundle, it's been phenomenally successful financially and in terms of the number of games it's put through the channel. And I think for the audience, I think a lot of the audience have really loved that kind of thing. OK. Moving on, I think one of the factors that we've seen with the PC that's a real problem, as I say, is the, the, the win from having a managed platform is being able to put things through a certain known, understood process. And kind of one of the things that's come out of that with mobile is the drive uh, to, towards cross-promotion, towards ad wars, towards very much more structured promotional and marketing channels often very tightly controlled by Apple. You know, some of them have arisen on, on the App Store and then been just taken straight back down again by Apple. And that mobile industry has picked up and learned some really interesting lessons about marketing, cross-promotion, performance and incentivized marketing. It's just been a phenomenal area of growth in the mobile space. And PC, often because they're premium, often because it's unmanaged and unstructured, hasn't followed in the same way. I don't think that's going to carry on for much longer. I think a lot of those lessons that people have learned in the mobile space about performance marketing, about um, cross-promotion, those are all going to be coming over to PC as well. And partly that's because there's an increasing adoption of free-to-play. But I think it's also just because the developers are getting closer to their audience. They're understanding how much money they need to spend on marketing. And suddenly, these tools are much more relevant to them too. So here, I think we'll see a very interesting period of evolution. Again, it's evolution because the PC market is behind other sectors, and they're going to have to catch up by learning from those other sectors. So I think we'll see a move across to PC-based cross-promotion platforms uh, and PC-based incentivized marketing campaigns. And I think Steam, interestingly, for all of their very developer-friendly, very... Uh, neutral approach to this kind of marketing and discovery problem, Steam need these problems solved too. They can't just have thousands and thousands of games with no clear infrastructure for discovery and marketing and promotion. So they are working on trying to find solutions to these problems, and I'm sure they're very open to hearing the, the third party's approaches to solving this. And of course, fundamentally, unlike Apple, and perhaps much more like Google Play, this is a complete free-for-all. You can put anything you like in your PC game in terms of cross-promotion and marketing. Nobody cares, right? This is totally up to you. The only audience you need to worry about are your players. And there's nobody going to tell you what you can and can't do. And again, I think once the PC market catches up with a lot of those lessons in other sectors, there's every opportunity to try some really interesting new things in here where they would be very difficult to try on the App Store. Although, obviously, you can also try new and clever things on, on the Android platform where you can get away with a lot more. OK, so this is, I think, this is the biggest issue for the PC. The whole definition of the device um, as a playing device is still dominated, I think, by desktop platforms rather than by um, laptops. And the fundamental problem of not having the device with you all the time, unlike all your phones and tablets, you know, that is a real issue. And I don't really see any easy solution to this. I mean, fundamentally, a device you're going to carry all the time is, is not what we're calling a PC. And I think if it becomes a device you're carrying all the time, it becomes a tablet. So I think where the PC ends up on that spectrum of being able to constantly engage with its audience, I think that's a real challenge for PC developers. 
because there are real wins to being able to talk to your audience all the time. Creative ones, game design ones, there's, there's some definite wins there. But I think what comes with that constant engagement is just more of a willingness by the player to spend money. So the whole issue of free-to-play arising as a successful medium, a successful model on PC, is partly an issue of how frequently you can draw players back into your game design and into your game such that you can monetize them. And I think the win here for the PC is probably going to be a lot more overlap with mobile titles. So you'll see a lot more PC games having some kind of mobile or tablet control or interface, something that allows the designer to find hooks which keep people playing and keep people involved in their PC game even when they're not sat in front of it. Fundamentally though, this is definitely the biggest issue. The whole idea of the demographic and connectiveness connectedness of mobile and tablet devices compared to the relatively specialist, relatively unconnected use of a PC. Just keeping myself in sync between the two screens. So, you know, the whole free-to-play revolution has clearly happened on mobile. It's been a huge driver of growth. Uh, and I think it's starting to be a big, big driver on PC. So there are clearly lots of genres, lots of types of games which don't work well as free-to-play. And I think those games will naturally do well on PC. I think the willingness of the current audience to spend money in a premium way is not something that's going to go away. So I think you'd see the growth of free-to-play on PC as an entirely additive move. I don't see it cannibalizing the current audience. I don't see it reducing revenues for people who've got premium games. I think actually what it'll do is it'll just draw more players, more consumers, more users into that ecosphere. So I don't see this as a loss at all. I think actually, as with mobile, this move is a fantastic opportunity. And I think it's never going to be quite as dominant just because of that existing demographic. But I, th I see this as a real win, and I think actually one of the big revolutionary things that's going to happen in the PC market over the next few years is a massive move towards free-to-play for a lot of PC games. And I think the biggest challenge there for developers of premium games is, as I say, not that they lose their existing audience or they lose their existing model. It's mainly going to be that they just get crowded out in terms of those marketing and discovery channels by people whose fundamental business model is huge volumes of players and therefore large amounts of money being spent on marketing. So I think that's the biggest threat from free to play to the existing PC developer and ecosystem, existing, existing PC model. But actually what you'll see is just lots of money being spent marketing these PC free to play games that are gonna come along. So what we've also seen, and I think again, the PC here in some ways is behind the curve with mobile just because so many uh, of the free-to-play games have driven games as a service as, as a development methodology. But actually, of course, pretty much all games are made on some kind of PC. They're not made on any other device. And PCs nowadays, we all assume, are permanently connected. I think this, this move to games as a service actually works really, really well for PC. I think the key thing about games as a service is direct engagement between your development team and your audience iteration, marketing, and feedback. And actually, although often release cycles are somewhat slower on PC, if you're talking about in-depth engagement by your audience with the evolution of your game, actually that's probably more likely to happen on a PC than it is on mobile. The ability of your players to be on forums, to be on third-party web services, to be finding updates through the platforms like Steam, all of those things are much more likely to happen in a kind of coherent way for you trying to plan your development as part of your marketing profile on the PC platform. So I think what we'll see here is we will see PC developers moving not just to games as a service, but the, the open development model that goes with that. The fact that you talk, talk to all of your audience as you're developing the game. I was talking to somebody yesterday saying they've now got their build machine set up to auto-tweet whenever they put a new build together. Right? It's just that level of transparency. Everything we do just goes straight out into the public domain. That works. Obviously, you could do that just as well on mobile, but it works on PC because the audience is probably there looking for that information. If they're going to be finding things, if they're going to be engaged with you, not just browsing, they're probably on one of these platforms, one of your platforms that we're talking about, one of the PC platforms. 
So I think this actually is somewhere where the PC is going to continue to push and push and push the envelope of what's possible in terms of the developer's presence with their audience and with their community. And I think we'll see some really, really interesting changes happening here where the community is much, much more closely involved in development. And here I think PC will lead just because of the nature of the platform. And I think uh, this is going to be a shock for a lot of developers. You know, Developers don't necessarily like being out there in the public mind, especially as people, especially as a development process. And I think it's going to be a really interesting change for a lot of people to actually have the real nitty gritty of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis exposed to their audience in a way that actually matters. It's not just exposed for the kind of gratuitous sake of being public about it. It will matter to your sales. It will matter to your audience engagement. Ultimately, it will matter to the quality of your game because you're relying to some extent on that feedback and that involvement to make the whole project a success. Kind of the next step on from that is the whole area of user-generated content. So the PC has been historically very strong in this area. Uh, right back, right, right, right back. I mean, my earliest, one of the first games I ever produced was a toolkit. It wasn't actually a game for producing flight sims. And you know, people out there on their three and a half inch floppies used to produce games of their own using the toolkit we produced. And that, that goes way back into the history of PC gaming. And this is a, a phenomenally deep strength of the industry, and of the PC sector. The fact that people have a sufficiently powerful device, by definition, when they're playing your game, to do much more sophisticated things with the game and the assets, uh, the editors, than, they, than you can do on any other device. And of course, compared to console, where there are some user-generated content options, you know, there's just much more freedom. It's much simpler. It's much more open. It's a much more practical thing to do. And I think that there are not enough PC games right now u utilizing and leveraging this ability of the device to create content for their game. Almost certainly, developers have tools, probably custom tools built into the way they're, they're making their game. There's probably a, a depth and a wealth of, of assets and code there that they could be exploiting in this slightly different way. And this all leads to consumer engagement. It gives you more to your IP, gives you more to your game, it gives you more of a reason for that player to keep talking to you. And it fits perfectly with the platform that we're talking about. So I think this is an area where the PC can continue to be totally revolutionary, probably the only platform that can really do this well. And it's one that I think far too few developers are taking advantage of. Far too many people want to hide that stuff in the background. And I just don't see any point to that at all. Moving on, kind of the natural follow-on from that whole user-generated content model is the platform model, you know, which maybe you could argue Minecraft is. Certainly if you look back at things like the rail simulator and flight simulator model, where you have huge communities actually building the content for you, often selling it on through your, either through your store or through other stores. And I think here we get to one of the really interesting things that's possible within the PC space that's always going to be difficult on all of the other platforms. User to user sales direct or indirect, whether through a store or just through your uh, billing mechanisms. User-to-user -user sales actually are a phenomenally important part of Steam success. The ability of people to create content in Steam's high-end games, their own titles, whether that actually makes them cash or just gives them kudos in the game, just gives them access to other people's assets, that ability to create things on a semi-professional, hobbyist, certainly potentially financial way is something I don't think any of the other platforms are going to be engage, able to engage with at all. And yet I see this as a phenomenally powerful way of drawing people into an existing IP, an existing community, and keeping them there. And Steam have talked a lot over the last couple of years about the way even their non-paying, the people who don't pay for additional assets in their big titles, you know, even the way, the fact that they still demand those assets, the fact that that audience actually wants the assets that other people are creating and they're willing to do things, to play, to make things happen in order to get those assets, means effectively you're able to drive and derive value out of the whole free-to-play spectrum, not just the people who are actually handing over cash, because everybody else is driving up the value of the assets that your users are able to create. They're actually adding demand. So one of the ways you can approach these platform models and you could, do this, you could argue this is true of a lot of free-to-play games, is that actually the, the great mass of people who don't pay 
for the extra items, what they are doing is they're driving up demand within the game, and they're driving up the value of the rest of those items. That's only a model that works if you can readily monetize that as part of the audience, one of the players. So I think this whole idea of user-to-user -user content, user-to-user -user sales is an extremely valuable area to explore. It's one where people get it right, they create very valuable businesses just standalone as a platform, and it's one I don't think any other platform but PC is really going to be able to do anything about. Just looking briefly at the other stores apart from Steam, you know, they're tiny. They constitute a small percent of sales in total. Uh, you know, you've got good old games, you've got the humble store. There are, there are competitors. And I think it's really, really interesting that Steam, who are, I think, a, a genuinely uh, straightforward company in that they're just trying to produce the best experience for their audience, and what comes out of that is building a very powerful platform, have ended up building a store which is absolutely dominant. You know, all classic economic theory says that when somebody is kind of 90% plus uh, as a percentage of a market, they become people who inevitably end up abusing that market. And so far, I think it's really questionable. You know, I don't see any evidence that Steam are really trying to do that. Indeed, they still do things like let other people use their keys, use their bandwidth, use their infrastructure without them making any money. They, they still seem to be doing a very reasonable job of not abusing their monopolistic position. I think Steam over the last year or two have really started to ratchet up their view of themselves as a platform company. They're starting to make moves which mean it is very difficult to not produce a Steam version of a PC game and be successful. That's always been true, I guess. But they're actually starting to now make it quite difficult to produce a successful Steam game without it effectively becoming an exclusive game on Steam. They're not doing that in any you know, underhand way. They're certainly not, as far as I know, doing it financially. But they, they are doing it by providing better services on Steam in a way that a lot of the other platforms are going to find it very hard to match, especially when it comes to these key services like being able to do user-to-user um, financial transactions, it's pretty hard for anybody else who's too small to match that kind of, kind of growth. So I think you know, Steam are doing a good job of not abusing their market position. And I think it's very interesting to see that they are becoming much, much more of a platform aware, platform savvy company than they used to be. And you know, I think we'll see as they finally remove Greenlight and as they put in place the kind of account management infrastructure that inevitably a platform of that scale is going to have, It'll be very interesting to see how their rules and regulations and their approach to developers and approach to new titles changes. But you know, so far, I think it's, it's looking positive, and I think it's, it's still true that other people can come in and play a useful role. Some of the other stores are trying to find differentiated ways they can, they can reach an audience. Remembering, of course, that in all of this conversation, on PC especially, there's always the issue of piracy, much more than uh, certainly on console. So you always have to remember there's a very viable free-to-play, even if it's not a free-to-play game, route out there for the consumer. So I think all of these stores are in a situation where if they don't provide good services, they're just going to end up with their titles being pirated anyway. So it's an interesting place to be. I think the fact that they are so small actually makes them a really interesting opportunity. Because really, even if they can just grow their market share a relatively small amount compared to Steam, it's still an enormous growth opportunity for those stores. So there are some real possibilities here for them to do clever and creative things and actually generate new avenues, new opportunities for developers. So far, I think Steam's running away with it, and I think that will go on being the case unless we see some fairly significant changes there. So I think this whole area of cross-device, this is a really important thing for PC to get right. Because it doesn't have that control platform and it doesn't have the ubiquity of mobile, I've not really talked much about console. I just don't, at the moment, I don't see console posing a, a massive threat to any of either of those two markets. I think PC and mobile will be the growth areas. Console is a big revenue point, but I just don't see it breaking out into new, new spaces. I think if PC can address this cross-device play and actually start to involve a lot more mobile games in, what, in what's going on uh, and in, involve mobile interfaces, mobile apps as means of getting into games, then I think we can see PC really grow you know, as the heart of that kind of approach. It's only really on the PC that you can do multiple OS, multiple device. You know, it's, an, it's a non-standard device in every possible sense. I think this is a, an area where PC is ultimately and pretty much inevitably going to lead. The thing they're missing at the moment is this kind of core trusted billing relationship. 
What's really interesting to me that on mobile, the thing that's driven, I think, a lot of mobile growth right back to the beginning was consumers trusted billing relationships, initially with Apple, and, and Google have struggled with that, which is one of the reasons why I think monetization is lower on Android than it is on, on iOS. It's that trusted billing relationship. And away from Steam, which is still a relatively hardcore platform, there's no alternative that matters to a sort of mass market demographic. So it'd be fantastic if somebody like Microsoft were to come in and actually try and solve that problem. I don't know whether they will. They should do, in my opinion. But I think there are all kinds of wins there for the platform if it can solve some of these problems. But I don't see on any other platform you know, being able to come close to the kind of innovation and opportunity for cross-device, cross-OS, uh, play, and monetization. I think just quickly, it's the same as the open development point. I think if you're looking for crowdfunding, both your audience as an indie is probably likely, it's probably a PC-based audience if you're an indie anyway, but the fact that you're doing those kinds of things through a PC rather than through a mobile interface a lot of the time, the fact that you've got this depth of engagement on, on PC platforms means I think crowdfunding is a much better fit for, for PC games, and I think it's actually a real strength as well. So we'll see. Uh, I think this continue to play out. Crowdfunding is going up, going down. You know, it's got its issues, but I'm pretty certain that it's going to be a net win for the PC for some considerable time. Uh, user interfaces, obviously, we've got the Oculus down the road there. Um, I think there will continue to be innovation here. I think, to me, it's interesting that the initial burst of creativity that came out of the, the very general purpose interface of mobile you know, that was, that was great. It's, in some ways, it's nice as a designer to be given huge constraints. It forces you to be creative on other axes. But I think ultimately, there is still a lot to be said for people coming out and playing with new ways of controlling games, new ways of interfacing with things. Again, I think this is something that will naturally lead in terms of creativity on PC. So I think we'll see some interesting things there. Personally, I'm pretty optimistic about what, what Oculus can do. Uh, and I think that is the place, you know, the PC, Oculus, Axis is going to be where we see the best of VR, in my opinion. So. And we shouldn't forget that the, the PC itself you know, continues to evolve. It's not the same sort of long, static um, life cycle of a console. And I think, again, compared to mobile, which, is, which has gone down a path of general purpose ubiquity, it is what it is. The tablet form factor, the phone form factor are what they are. I don't see those evolving in the same way now from a consumer point of view or from a creative point of view that you're going to be able to do on these devices. And I think things like the Surface 3 you know, might be a big opportunity for sort of casual gamers to get back involved in this space. I think this is back to my earlier point. It's the demographics that goes with the ubiquity. That's the challenge. The issue for PC is very much can it get itself away from its existing indie, hardcore, study playing, you know, playing in the study type audience and out into a more general purpose place. And if it could do that, I think then it's got absolutely every opportunity to just go off in every single direction. The problem, coming back to that unmanaged platform approach, is I don't see anyone driving this. I think the only organization that's really in a position to try and drive this kind of demographic spread of the device is Microsoft. They could do that coupled with billing innovations. They could do it coupled with operating system innovations. So far, they've shown absolutely no understanding of how to widen the appeal of that operating system in a consumer sense. And frankly, I don't see any likelihood they're going to do that in the short term. So I think this is the biggest challenge. It's getting beyond the existing audience with some major moves. OK, this is an area which I think is back to being revolutionary. The whole move to eSports and the accompanying viewing of PC game, well, of game playing, but particularly of game, PC game playing, I think is an absolutely revolutionary trend right now in the PC sector. I think this is it's just a way, it's, there's a growth going on here. There's a, an engagement with an audience, a w very wide audience, that is just hard to overstate. It's a phenomenal opportunity for the entire PC sector, the entire games industry. And it's one I think we need to pick up and run with. It's one we need to embrace. I think it's obviously specific to certain genres. Uh, there's, there's a limit to what you can do if you're making you know, adventure games here. There's not a lot you can do in terms of esports, right? But 
I think it's something where the industry needs to uh, accept the challenge that the audience is giving us, and try and find ways in which we can take our games out into this mode of entertainment. You know, fundamentally, it's what we do. We produce entertainment, right? And this is a way of reaching entertainment beyond just the player. And that, I think, is a way of driving huge audience engagement from the PC. And fundamentally, it's going to be very hard to do on a personal device like a phone or a tablet. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity for the PC games industry, and one that actually could totally revolutionize the way we perceive it. OK. Kind of wrapping up now, I think this is, to me, the, the key point. The, the, Games industry is all about creativity. You know, we're a creative industry, we're making entertainment. We have to be able to make things which are innovative, which are new, which embrace a new audience. And it's very, very hard to do that if you're on a platform like a console where there's a very strict control over what can reach, what can end up on that device, you know, what can get to the audience, what can fundamentally be produced. And I think on mobile, there are some real limits in terms of the way the audience approach things, particularly about the way they're pay or don't pay for games, that premium price point issue, and also about being able to engage with a fan, somebody who's an active, involved player in your, in your game. Mobile has all kinds of issues too. I think fundamentally, right now, creativity is best done on PC. This is the best place to be creative, to be innovative as a designer. And I think as a creative industry, the platform which best supports creativity is always going to have a very strong edge over other platforms which don't. So my view is the PC's current market position is really strong. And I think a lot of the things that are going to be revolutionary in the games industry and in games, in the entertainment we produce over the next few years are going to be led on the PC sector, despite the huge opportunity that comes with mobile and the huge amounts of money in console. This is a sector I think you can't afford to ignore. OK, that's my presentation. I hope that was useful. Uh, on to the Q&A. But it is Friday afternoon, so if there's no questions, that'll be fine with me too. If you want to go ahead, I have one Twitter, Twitter one, but I have to find it, so go ahead. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is, what do you think about players like Microsoft and Apple trying to replicate a mobile-like model with app stores onto the PC and maybe trying to be the main channel for distribution of games? Uh, so it would not be an open world, as, as you say. And secondly, you, you, you are talking about reaching new audiences. Um, the social games example, um, we go against what you say. I mean, the social games were totally eaten by the mobile games business, uh, and especially with these very casual audiences. Uh, and all of the casual games, downloadable casual games, that were being sold even maybe five years ago, now they're really, really at a bad point, uh, and they have to switch to the mobile, mobile. they want to, to, to keep on going. Yeah, OK. So the first question about uh, Apple and Microsoft's app stores. You know, I think it's really interesting to me that in, in this platform, you can't be as closed. I think if they were going to be successful, they would have to be much closer in terms of mentality to something like the Google Play Store. And I think that's fundamentally a difficult concept for both Apple and Microsoft for different reasons. So I don't see them being successful unless they were much more open, much more amenable to the developers driving innovation through those platforms and allowing the user to make more autonomous choices to be given a more you know, wild frontier to play in. So fundamentally, I think they can't be successful unless they are more open-minded about the way they approach it. And I think you know, Microsoft's um, Windows App Store pretty much still born. The Apple Mac App Store you know, revenues for games just tiny, tiny in there. Interestingly, though, if they can get through that loop and create the virtuous circle that every app store hopes to get to, where more players, more users, means more apps, which means more users, which means more apps, if they can get into that cycle, then inevitably developers will have to follow. You know, you have to go where the audience is. I personally think it would be to the long-term detriment of the PC as a games platform if that's the way everything went and they were those kind of Apple-style closed platforms. 
So I think that would be a bad thing for the very long term. But my belief is that unless they were to do that sort of open, you know, pretty much uncontrolled, just trying to provide a useful app management service, which is what the Google Play Store, I think, tries to do, and to some extent Steam tries to do at its root, you know, if you're just trying to emulate that, then that would be a, a win. But I don't see either of those two companies being able to embrace that approach. I think the, 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 the issue of you know, the, the fact that the casual games have, have all been driven off these devices, that is a problem. And I think it's symptomatic of where the audience is and symptomatic of the play sessions being very short. You know, so I think that there is a, it's, it's almost insurmountable to me. I don't see how you can get away from the fact that by definition what a PC is is not a very short, transient, casual experience platform. That, so that, that segment I think is probably gone unless we started to see you know, much smaller laptops that people carried around and effectively took over the tablet market, but then you could argue a PC is a tablet, so you know, it's, a, it's a different argument. I don't think that's, that's going to come back. There's any way around that. I do think that, does, that there are still huge opportunities to grow the demographic on PC. I don't think that's not true. You know, the fact that you can't do casual, very short play session games does not mean that you can't attract more women, does not mean you can't attract more old people, does not mean you can't attract more casual players. It's just fundamentally casual is going to be something that's driven by the device that's most convenient and most to hand when you have a short period of time, which is almost certainly not a PC. Sure, go ahead. Thanks. I know they're recording the session, so if you don't use the mic, they won't hear the question. Um, so it's interesting you should talk about definition of PC, because I think that's something I'd really appreciate a little bit more of your opinion on. So as you get devices of the power of, say, the NVIDIA Shield attached to a 1080p TV, you know, three or four controllers and a keyboard, um, you know, at that point in time, are you really looking at a tablet or a console or a PC? So what is the definition for you of, I mean, I, I hear what you say about mm -hmm. play session time and things like that. So yeah, I think definition? that's a really interesting question because, you know, almost by definition as the industry is growing, people are moving hardware into every niche. And they're moving form factor into every niche. I think the thing that, that kind of defines a PC for me is um, actually that ability to go beyond the product, you know, to be able to, if you can't do something like user-generated content, if you can't swap out easily to a web forum to comment or to, a, you know, a video channel to go and watch somebody else playing the game, you're probably not on a PC. Now, some of those things can be done on other devices. But, I, you know, and I do think it is a spectrum. There's no question. So I, th I think it's, it would be really interesting to go, let's imagine, because there are Linux boxes which are very small and portable, essentially tablets. You know, is that a PC? Well, not by the definition I'm using. I think it's more about saying there's an engagement that the audience can have with these games, which is almost the antithesis of short play session casual, but which gives you lots of other opportunities, which I think developers and creatives need to exploit, need to work with to maximize the power of the platform. But ultimately, Gaming is going to move to engagement with an audience, and if it's eSports, it's engagement with an audience that aren't even playing the game. And it's that engagement that is what we're trying to sell. You know, it's entertaining engagement is what we sell. Okay, I have a question from Twitter. Um, this goes back to the crowdfunding and Steam. Uh, what about the alpha version sold on Steam without guarantee of the game being finished, sometimes breaking the trust people had with Steam and the indie devs? Evolution or regression? It's short-term regression for long-term long -term win. I think one of the nice things is this is a platform where consumers have a little bit less trust. I mean, Steam has trust, so it's a problem for Steam. But I think the platform as a whole, people don't necessarily have a huge amount of trust. There's lots of piracy, there's viruses, there's all kinds of other issues around this platform. So there's a certain, that's a, that's, in some ways, that's almost a freeing thing for a developer. You can probably get away with being able to, to make mistakes in this environment, perhaps in ways that you wouldn't be able to do on other platforms, partly because there is no platform controller. So there's nobody who's going to turn around afterwards and go, you know what, you're just not coming onto our platform again because you got that so badly wrong last time. But you know, clearly, it's really, it is bad when, when consumers' expectations aren't met. 
that's inevitably true. But I think consumers' faith in PC gaming is not undermined by the occasional failure to meet expectations in a way that it certainly would be on console and to a lesser extent on mobile, where they expect the device to just work and don't really get the concept of things which are broken in the first place. Okay. Any other questions? You quickly touched on the issue the, of the higher the developer or the publisher being in the market, the higher the risk of cannibalizing his own products. And I just come from a talk with uh, Michael Sportach, the, um, who is responsible for the Destiny title that just arrived. And we actually had the same conversation concerning the Call of Duty franchise, which is also um, made by Activision. Um, and now the Destiny title. So what's your take on it? Do you think that's a mistake, releasing it so close to each other? Or do you think that's just a unique take on the same uh, idea that you had? Yeah, no, I, I think for that point in time, Activision must have seen cannibalization of at least playtime and probably revenue between those two titles. I just I don't see how they could have not done that. You know, they, they're faced with a difficult problem of there's only so many windows in the year when you can launch a title like that. You have to go big or don't bother. So they probably just had to accept that that was a consequence of what they were doing. I, you know, that's not a problem that most of us face. And if you are facing that problem, you're probably not worrying about it too much, let's face it. And I actually have a second question because you said that the free-to-play was only an additive to the PC game market. And I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that because when I was a developer, uh, well, I would have been a developer, and I were to maybe create a new mobile game where I would say, okay, I have a new take on the gameplay, on the core game loop or whatever that does not involve some kind of free-to-play mechanism. Wouldn't I be very hard-pressed to promote it or to publish it in any way when there are so big players like League of Legends, Dota, or then Heroes of the Storm outside that all function via the free-to-play model? Wouldn't that kind of force me into the same route? I, th my, I think you know, there's, a, there's a certain logical argument that if you've got that much going on on free-to-play, and like I say, there's, a, there's an issue with discovery and marketing where I think they could be an issue. They could crowd people out just from discovery and marketing. But I think in terms of actual playtime and you know, the audience being there, I don't see that audience going away because there is an additional free-to-play audience. I, I do think the net will be additive. We'll need to see it from the numbers. You know, but so far, I don't see any sort of financial evidence that the PC, the core PC premium market isn't continuing to grow. But the free-to-play market is obviously coming in on top of that, growing even more. So th there is a discovery issue. There's definitely going to be a problem okay. if the front of every store is filled up with people buying marketing to, give, to promote their free-to-play game, and discovery becomes a problem there. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? <laughs> it's Friday afternoon and Paris awaits our trip home, one or the other. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone.